Good morning. I'm Don Cohn in the Economic Studies Program here at Brookings, and I'm happy to welcome you to the first uh, panel of the, of the day, the financial sector, how has it changed? I think uh, there are a lot of questions we could address uh, this morning, and hopefully our panelists will, and if they don't, I'll ask them questions about it. Um, has it changed enough? Is the financial sector resilient enough to maintain stability? Are there ways in it has changed too much, gone too far, perhaps in a regulatory direction, um, because it and impaired its ability to deliver key intermediation services as efficiently and effectively as possible? Are some kinds of changes more, have they been more productive and effective than other kinds of changes? Can we identify ways in which we like to see some things undone, but further, further progress made in certain areas. What about this um, migration of activity that uh, Dick was talking about? How, what are our thoughts on that? So we have a terrific panel to address uh, these questions. Uh, you have their biographies in front of you. Less briefly, Raj and Cohn is the senior chairman at Sullivan and Cromwell everybody's go-to guy for legal advice uh, in the banking sector, and I think importantly because he has a very acute ability to see things from the regulator's side as well as from the bank side and to find mutually agreeable ways of getting through to accomplish everybody's objectives. Peter Fisher uh, was my colleague in the Federal Reserve for many years when he was at the New York Fed. He's been in the U.S. Treasury. He's seen life from both sides. He's been at BlackRock, and now he's at Dartmouth at Tuck, looking at life from above, so <laughs> completely objective. Aaron Klein is the Director of Financial Regulatory Reform Initiative, Bipartisan Policy Center, and Aaron, working often with Martin, has been very, very active in trying to identify these regulatory issues and how things could change and how not. So we have a terrific panel. Each panelist, and we'll go in that alphabetical order, each panelist will have 10 minutes, and then uh, we'll gather on the stage and see what questions we can come up with. So Rajan, you want to start? Thank you, Don, and good morning. It's really my honor to be here with you today, and particularly with my distinguished co-panelists. Now, notwithstanding claims to the contrary, the financial in industry has changed significantly since the financial crisis. But change is not inherently a value judgment, and I'm going to divide the industry changes since 2008 into the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good changes relate to a banking industry that is considerably stronger in financial terms. This begins with a sharp improvement in high-quality capital ratios with an increase of particular magnitude at the largest banks. The most recent capital proposal for U.S. GSIBs is between two and three times the requirements prior to the crisis. Leverage capital requirements have increased at an equivalent pace. Moreover, these formal requirements understate the practical regulatory requirements in two important respects. First, because of regulatory and reputational reasons, no bank can afford to fall below its capital requirement, even if a portion is stated to be a buffer. Therefore, the actual practical capital requirement is likely to be 75 to 100 basis points higher than formal requirements. Second, most banks believe that the most restrictive capital requirement is likely to be derived from the CCAR process. Because of both the stated approach and the opaqueness of CCAR, banks are again effectively required to maintain capital well above stated regulatory requirements. It's not just the amount of capital, but the capital planning process that has improved under the watchful eye of the Fed, modeling and overall analysis are much more rigorous. A similar phenomenon has occurred with respect to liquidity. The current and proposed formal liquidity requirements are sharply higher than the prior informal supervisory guidance, 
And again, there's been a sharp improvement in liquidity management. Finally, I actually believe banks are less risky because they are more focused on risk management and compliance. Institutions are now, perhaps belatedly, devoting some of their best and brightest to these two areas. There is a common understanding that both are appropriately viewed as prevention of loss rather than simply incurrence of cost functions. Now, the bad change relates to the overall impact of the multiple regulatory changes on industry profitability, particularly in terms of return on equity, which is the metric perhaps most important for investors. Compliance costs have soared. Liquidity requirements reduce the amount of higher earning assets. These, earning, these earnings pressures are compounded by the unparalleled prolonged low interest rate environment since 2008, which has sharply reduced net interest income throughout the entire industry. Just as the steep decline in the price of oil produced winners, airlines, auto manufacturers and consumers, and losers, oil companies and vendors, so, too, the low interest rate environment has produced winners and losers. The winners are borrowers, both commercial and consumer, and the losers are the lenders, particularly the banks. Now, this combination of lower profitability and specific regulatory requirements have caused the migration of large swaths of bank business to the less regulated or even unregulated non-banks, which Dick was referring to. There are multiple examples, mortgage servicing, consumer lending, leverage lending, and subprime lending. And there is now a direct threat to the core of banking, Silicon Valley's efforts to take over payments. A perhaps even more troubling migration is that of talented individuals from banks to non-banks. This may be due not so much to higher compensation opportunities as avoidance of the soaring bank enforcement risk. This overall situation raises a number of troubling policy questions and requires a thorough government analysis. Now the ugly. That involves the reduction of the government's ability to respond to a future financial crisis. We actually got off to a positive start. The inexplicably reviled Title II of Dodd-Frank created a thoughtful and balanced framework for resolving systemically significant financial institutions, and it will soon be supplemented by TLAC requirements and single point of entry. But the effectiveness of Title II remains jeopardized by the absence of formal, ideally binding, international agreement on resolution. In numerous other respects, however, the government's response capacity has been degraded. I'll just catalog a few of these developments. First, the Federal Reserve's capacity to provide investment and even liquidity has been restricted by the constriction of Section 13.3. And astonishing, astonishingly, or perhaps not in the current political environment, there are proposals to reverse the basic tenets of central banking and limit even further the Federal Reserve's role as a lender of last resort. Second, in an astonishing example of short-sightedness, the government has penalized institutions for the sins of companies that were acquired in emergency transactions with the encouragement and even the instigation of the government. Third, as new requirements were imposed on acquisitions by large financial institutions, the standard exemptions for emergency acquisitions were not always incorporated. Fourth, a combination of the new capital and liquidity requirements could pro-cyclically reduce the availability of credit at a time of financial weakness or even uncertainty. And fifth, a combination of the Volcker Rule and capital requirements could reduce, as, a, as Dick uh, prior previously indicated, liquidity in a number of fixed income asset classes. And compounding these five issues, there seems to be little, if any, comprehensive research and analysis of how the plethora of new requirements will, taken as a whole, affect the markets and the government's ability to respond in the event of disruption. The one silver lining in, in all of this is that almost all these problems are fixable if there is the will, as well as the willingness to disregard and even call out the counterfactual myths 
that continue to persist about the financial crisis. We should not be placed in a position where our financial institutions are considerably better prepared to deal with the financial crisis, but our government is not. I cannot resist closing with a mention of one other, other ugly change, and this is an apparent shift in the paradigm for the relationship between the regulator and the regulated from one of cooperation, collaboration, and two-way transparency to one of tension, suspicion, distance, and opaqueness. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. That's a challenge to come after Raj. I've had to do that before, so I'm, uh, I'm used to it. Um, uh, let me make a few points uh, after Raj's terrific remark. First, let me say uh, I'm going to take a more conceptual approach to the topic. Um, most risk management failures are not computational. They are conceptual. This applies both to institutions and to the financial system as a whole. Uh, that uh, if we think of the financial sector as a device we use to pump up credit in order to pump up demand, uh, then I'm afraid we're stuck in a dilemma in which we cannot promote growth, both growth and stability at the same time. Uh, but let me first uh, come to two threshold problems. Um, first, I uh, am intrigued to see the outbreak of sympathy for the plight of the poor bond trader by central bankers and policymakers the world over. Uh, the, the deep empathy and concern for how hard it must be to execute transactions uh, might have something to do with the realistic fear that prices might go down. After almost a decade of pumping up asset prices, uh, worry the central bankers should. Uh, Credit Suisse tells us that gro global household wealth has doubled so far in this century. The World Bank tells us that global GDP has doubled so far in this century. To double in a mere 15 years, you must compound at approximately 4.73%. I don't believe there's anyone here today or anyone I'm aware of who thinks that the productivity of the human species has been compounding at that rate for the last 15 years. Thus, we have a certain gap. Uh, if productivity were expanding at about 2%, uh, then we would have uh, added about 35% to the stock of productive assets. Instead, we have doubled it. So I'll simply observe that the prices of financial assets seem to be unencumbered by any particular relationship to the productive potential of the human species. Uh, so worry about market liquidity, you might. Uh, secondly, we have a threshold problem. And uh, I anticipated uh, Raj's remarks. Let me just say in my own words that we will not have a coherent discussion of this subject so long as we maintain the fiction that the authorities can limit a thing called risk, impose costs to contain the thing called risk without a materiality or cost-benefit analysis, insist on knowing the right level of capital, all without regulating the return to capital. That simply is not a coherent position, and the dialogue will not be an effective one. I'd much rather we have a, co a candid conversation about the return to financial capital than that we ignore the subject. Um, but uh, on a more um, uh, going forward basis, let me say, um, I think that we have this conceptual flaw uh, in how we think about the role of the financial sector in promoting growth. Uh, I, think, I think of the economy as having three, not two, circulatory systems. Uh, first, we have the producers and consumers of goods and services. Uh, secondly, we have the sources and uses of funds. Uh, and third, we have the sources and absorbers of volatility. Now, if you are simply trapped in a world where you only think of the first two circulatory systems, uh, and then you think of financial intermediaries as the agents that stand between the sources and uses of funds, and in order to promote consumption and investment in the first circulatory system, you pump up the size of the intermediaries in order to stimulate consumption and investment, then I'm afraid you're trapped, more or less, in this dilemma in which you promote growth by expanding a thing we call the financial sector, and then and see how far it can go uh, until you decide to stop. Now, uh, one dilemma we have is, is uh, another, another way of saying this, is uh, how can we expect the financial sector to promote growth and stability at the same time 
if our central bank declines to articulate how it will do so. Uh, just about 11 months ago, we had the chair of the Federal Reserve speak at the IMF and say she was going to decline to do that, uh, with interest rate policy at least. Macroprudential policy is an interesting hypothesis, one which I would like to point out is unencumbered by any relationship to actual experience. A mere eight years ago, we all would have identified one country on the planet who'd done the best job of implementing risk-based capital in order to have a a profound macroprudential approach, and that would have been Spain. And we were all wrong. So we all linger with the thought, uh, with the hopeful thought, that we can have a thing called risk-based capital, which will provide a clinical and sort of autopilot approach to financial stability. If the financial sector wants to take more risk, they have to hold more capital. It'll all just take care of itself in a tidy uh, mechanism. Uh, I think we've, we've lost uh, hope for that. Um, I do think, though, if you add the third circulatory system to your conception of the financial sector, uh, that is, the sources and absorbers of volatility, and ask yourself what balance sheets are well-placed to act as absorbers rather than magnifiers of, of uh, volatility. Um, I'd like to point out that risk is an empty bag. The word risk doesn't help you very much. Uh, risk is deviation from objective. And until you've decided what the objective a financial intermediary is serving, you don't know how to measure its risk. And if you insist on having a single one-dimensional uh, view of risk for all financial intermediaries, you're going to miss the boat entirely. They all run different volatility mismatches. They all are both driven by and constrained by volatility <coughs> mismatches. Uh, that's how they make money. A financial intermediary will not make any money unless they run a certain volatility mismatch. And they will inevitably die if they run volatility mismatches that are too large or that cannot be contained. There are, however, volatility mismatches that are sufficiently large, they will never be remedied by a thing called capital. It's simply, it, it's not going to be in the ken of, of uh, the great and the good gathered here together and in other places to get capital requirements up to the level. Uh, that will let you run any volatility mismatch you want uh, simply by adding capital. I think th that's part of the failure of the risk-based capital regime at the conceptual level. Um, but if we look inside the volatility mismatches they each run, if we ask different questions about what do we expect pension funds to do, what do we expect insurance companies to do, what do we want commercial banks to do, and we, we have a thoughtful conversation and dialogue and policy debate about what volatility mismatches do you want which kinds of intermediaries to run, I think then we will be moving toward a financial system uh, that can, be, can promote growth and, stability, uh, and financial stability both. But as long as we're trapped in what I call the first two circulatory systems, we ignore the volatility mismatch system, and we just focus on producers and consumers of goods and services and sources of uses of funds, and the authorities view the intermediaries as the things to be pumped up in order to stimulate demand, uh, then I'm afraid um, we're not going to be able to reconcile growth and stability through the financial sector. Thank you. Great. Uh, if Peter had a hard job following Rajan, now I have the, a harder job uh, following both folks. Uh, I'm Aaron Klein, the director of the financial uh, BPC's Financial Regulatory Reform Initiative. Uh, the slide I'm going to go through builds on the work that we've done, which includes uh, the wisdom of Martin Bailey, our co-chair, and, and Peter and Rajan, who work with the task forces and the initiative, uh, and also a paper that Martin, myself, and Justin Chardon did uh, forthcoming. So there we go. So if you think about an assessment of, of Dodd-Frank uh, and some of the other exchanges uh, that have been added on since for the financial crisis, we've kind of broken things down into a few different categories about financial stability and, and economic growth. I want to start with just a few words on what is financial stability? 
Uh, the most stable financial system is one in which there's no lending. That's a tautology, right? The safest transportation system is the one in which people don't move. Neither of those outcomes is desirable. I actually quite enjoyed um, uh, Dick Berner's view about talking about resiliency instead of stability, right? We want a system where people move and they move quickly and efficiently, but safely. And if there's a problem and one delay at LaGuardia Airport, the whole nation isn't grounded for the day. So you want a system that is resilient, perhaps is a better goal than stability, but I'm not going to fight a nomenclature battle at the moment. And we'll we will step back and say there are a couple things that were done that were clear wins, that increased financial stability and promoted economic growth. Uh, there were things that were clear losses that both would promote instability and retard economic growth. Uh, then there were some costly trade-offs. Different people can have different perspectives on what value to place on stability and avoiding a, another financial crisis versus potentially limiting our ability to grow. There were many years in America where we had a speed limit of 55. People moved around l more slowly. We've raised it to 65 and 70. Doesn't seem to be much of a cost in safety. People grow fast, move faster. Some people may want to go back or not. One uh, point on that analogy that, that came to me, by the way, we reduced the speed limit not for safety. The speed limit was put in place to, to deal with an oil embargo and improve fuel efficiency. Very different objectives. Sometimes the objective that was uh, articulated at the time then becomes co-opted in the future. And I think that's something worth thinking about in terms of finance. Um, finally, I think there was some unfinished business uh, as well as some things that are, are too soon to tell. So let me kind of get to the, the main slide here. We try to group these things in, in four different concepts and, and start on a positive note. Let's talk about the clear wins. Uh, increased capital. I think it was a clear win. The financial system, banks especially, just had too little capital. We increased leverage ratios. We improved our risk-based capital models, uh, put in stress testing, et cetera. I do want to riff on one point Peter made about the over-reliance on risk-based capital, considering that about kind of the simple leverage ratio. And I think part of the derivation of this actually comes from Moore's law. So the great advances in computing power have allowed us to model things that were heretofar way too complicated. Think about for a moment trying to do Basel II with punch cards, right? Nobody would have proposed such a system. But just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. Just because our computing technology and models have advanced perhaps well beyond financial theory as discussed uh, earlier doesn't mean that you should be able to model it. In fact, I think as a society we've become too interested in data points and point estimates of risk and point estimates of capital and haven't really appreciated confidence intervals, our own statistical uncertainty of what the data tell us. And in that point, there's a little bit of a, a parallel to volatility, right? As long as you think you have it, you don't realize the, the gap and, and uh, movement that you can experience. So we think maybe perhaps uh, we've become a hopefully the financial crisis will produce some amount of humility in our own ability to have confidence in what our computers can output if given the right numerical input. Title II in the resolution process is one of the great wins in Dodd-Frank. It's also one of the most bipartisan parts of the bill. I wouldn't be doing my BPC job if I didn't remind folks that over, I think, 92 senators voted for Title II. I think the FDIC has done a very good job. I agree with Rajan's point. They could put a little more binding clarity and international agreements would be, would be helpful. Uh, mandatory clearing and settlement, something else that we think make, makes the system both more stable, more resilient, and grow faster. And the creation of the CFPB. Uh, there is a clear nexus between financial stability and the implementation of consumer protection and establishing one unified voice to speak for the consumer we think was a clear win. Turn to a second uh, for the costly trade-offs. Uh, the Volcker Rule and the Lincoln Amendment, uh, we thought we looked at, uh, th there's a cost. It is not a free lunch. Different people of different minds can agree whether these things were good or bad net-net, but they're significant trade-offs. Uh, we think Congress was wise in effectively repealing the Lincoln Amendment uh, because the Volcker Rule kind of gets at the same problem, uh, and that seemed to be the, the route that folks wanted to go. So one of the concerns with Dodd-Frank was in the quest for financial stability, uh, lots of problems were put in, uh, solutions were put in, often to address the same problem. There was a moment when I was uh, helping to negotiate TARP, uh, the Troubled Asset Relief Purchase Program, and there were three different ideas for how to oversee it. 
And the three members of, of Congress who had the three different ideas, we were under tremendous time pressure to get the bill done, looked at each other and said, well, I'll take yours if you take mine. And we ended up with three different overseers, and today we, TARP has an IG whose budget is larger than that of the office of which they oversee, <laughs> along with two other over, uh, uh, past overseers. So sometimes you can throw too much spaghetti at the wall and have too many solutions in there. Uh, the third is the resolution, restrictions on crisis authority. We view this as a clear loss. Uh, Rajan pointed out as much, and I'd echo that, it wasn't just the restrictions on 13.3, but also on the FDIC, whose TLGP, Temporary Liquidity Guarantee Program, was one of the great tools of the financial crisis. It was very much uh, unforeseen as a potential path to use that authority in ways that the folks who, who created it never thought so, but had a tremendous uh, value in addressing the moment of instability. I'm going to flash ahead for a second. But if I told you that there was a government program that saved middle class jobs, promoted economic growth, promoted financial stability, and made a profit for the US taxpayer, that sounds as close as a free lunch in policy as possible. But in reality, the programs that did that, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, the FDIC's TLG pro TLGP program, and the Federal Reserve's bailouts under 13.3 of AIG and Bear Stearns, uh, all made money. They, they summed at $68 billion of profit for the taxpayer uh, and promoted fi financial stability. Yet they seem to not only be to this day politically unpopular, but there are desires to continue to move in that wrong direction, which we think would be very problematic. Lastly, things that didn't go far enough, uh, regulatory consolidation, we still have too fragmented a regulatory system that we think could promote instability in fighting within regulators was, a so, was it one of the a source of the potential source of the financial crisis uh, and also uh, hindered our response. Uh, the creation of the FSOC was a step forward in promoting regulatory cooperation, uh, but we think we ought to go farther, farther with some amount of consolidation uh, and some more empowering on the FSOC. It hasn't been quite put to the test uh, but there are ways in which if the FSOC identified problems, it couldn't resolve them. The system still allows a certain amount of regulatory gridlock, uh, which would be problematic. We have our, our own solutions. For example, if nine of the 10 regulators think one of the regulators ought to pro uh, propose a rule that Congress required them to write, our system still allows that one regulator to sit on that rule, whether intentionally or because they can't reach consensus within their group. We think that's a problem. Uh, the Office of Financial Research, to uh, Martin asked a question, I'll answer it. We think they ought to wave the alarm uh, bell. They ought to wave the flag. Structurally, the FSOC, the Treasury Secretary, and the Federal Reserve are just limited in their ability to call out for crisis by the very roles in which they encumber. And our uh, system needs somebody who's empowered and has that authority and autonomy to do so. Uh, there are a couple things that are too soon to tell. I'd include in that the regulation of insurance uh, we think we're always solving the last problem, which came through the financial, the banking sector, insurance, the traditional business of insurance uh, was, was pretty solid through that process. Uh, but now we've uh, put in a whole new regulatory regime. The Federal Reserve regulates a third, 30% uh, uh, of the insurance industry. So just to check, we asked in a non-scientific way, 300 or so experts in terms of what was uh, good, bad, and ugly, to use Rajan's point of view. And I'd point out kind of the things we discussed, higher capital, resolution, TLAC, clearing, all came out very net positive. Limits on the Fed and FDIC's emergency authority and the Lincoln Amendment were negative. Uh, Lincoln's been repealed. Hopefully, going forward, we'll see Congress act to, to, to reverse their mistake on the Fed and FDIC emergency authority. Thank you very much. Thank you all for very, uh, very interesting and uh, thought-provoking remarks. And let's see if we can get a uh, conversation started. Rajan, I'll start with you since you started. Wait one second, Don. Okay.
So I'd like to follow up on the bad part of your good, bad, and ugly. I think uh, Aaron followed up on the ugly part very nicely. Um, and I'll follow up with him on that. Uh, you were worried about um, costs and earnings and ROE in this uh, new environment. So what would you do about it? How would, are there a particular, is there too much capital being required? And I, uh, sort of a, a comment on this is, in theory, if you've got more capital and you're less risky, the requirement for ROE is lower. And banks have been selling equity, some banks anyhow, raising equity in markets. It's not as if they're shut out entirely. So a, little, a, a few more reflections on your ROE concerns. OK. Um, and it's a very fair point, Don. Um, I do think we are at the outer limits of where capital should be required. But I believe the markets are skeptical as to what more will be necessary. Um, TLAC is a case in point. No one knows where those numbers will come out. And more importantly, no one knows what the formula will be in terms of what counts, what doesn't, how is it weighted. So um, ultimately, yes, I'll go back to, I thought, the excellent analogy which Aaron drew between uh, transportation safety and facilitating transportation and capital. Ever increasing capital ultimately has to have an impact. And where the markets are worried that the regulators believe and the government believes that there is no restraint on the amount of capital that can be imposed. That is a problem for investors. And I am not convinced that there is the trade-off if banks are not able to earn 10% ROE, no matter how safe, particularly when they're sitting with dividend restrictions as a result of CCAR, I think you risk losing huge uh, areas of investors. And you don't think we're on our way to resolving. It's really, partly this is about uncertainty, about what might right. be coming next, et cetera. And you, that process is still evolving and evolving so much that it's not clear what's coming next. I, I think that is fair, uh, including what happens if you make an acquisition uh, do you have another 50 basis points every time, if you're a GSIB, that you do a deal? If I could just connect it Please. to the thought I offered, which is that the regulators across the board seem to have a difficulty applying either a materiality or a cost-benefit analysis to all of their requirements. <laughs> that they want to be bulletproof against the next crisis. So they think if something looks risky, they want either more capital against it or more staff hired uh, to, to reme remediate. And there isn't an apparent willingness to apply materiality or cost benefit or something that would let you make a judgment about the wisdom. And I think that's what feeds the uncertainty uh, in the capital markets that, that Raj is referring to. So do you think the regulators ought to be required to do a formal cost benefit analysis of any new regulation they put forward? I think they're going to end up having to. And I wish they would just do it without Congress requiring it. I mean, I, I don't I mean Congress, we might get around to Congress rewriting some of the rules. Um, I think that uh, w once you work through my little piece of algebra, that they're regulating the return to capital in, in the sectors they regulate, they're going to have to. And I'm, maybe it's just going to take several more cycles for them to realize they've got to come up with a materiality threshold. So I think, uh, Peter, I agree with you that in the regular context of regulating against problems, there's a lot of value from a cost-benefit framework. I get very worried about it in the framework of financial stability. And I'm worried about it because what are the benefits of avoiding a crisis? So if a crisis costs $14 trillion, then a 1% chance to avoid it would be worth a $140 billion of regulatory cost, an absurdly large sum. Right? Would it, having promoted uh, some subprime regulations had a 1% chance of averting the crisis? 
Probably. Would anybody at the time have thought so? Hardly, very few. 0.1% chance of avoiding a crisis, $14 billion of cost. Can anybody credibly say whether a regulation has a 0.1% chance of avoiding a crisis? No. And so I'm, I'm worried that when you get this far out in a tail risk framework, cost benefit starts to break down. I'm not a fan of cost benefit. I'm just saying something, materiality, because it's some metric for, and, and I offer thinking about volatility mismatches inside intermediaries, that if you're not thinking about this, the, the totality of the asset liability position and how it comes together and what kind of volatility mismatch that is, um, then you, you're not going to have any basis for drawing the line. So a, a comment and then a follow-up question. My comment is, as a member of the Financial Policy Committee at the Bank of England, we were required by law to have our... Um, to be proportionate in our actions. Mm -hmm. Not well defined, but, but it does give you a sense, but also to do cost benefit analysis where possible. And I would say to Aaron's point, that's the, he's pointed to the exact problem. It's much easier to identify the costs, the compliance costs or the costs of slightly less available uh, credit than it is to identify the benefit of avoiding the next uh, next crisis. So, uh, but I, I still think going through that process, even though in the end we say this is really hard and we can't really have a very precise uh, CBA here, is a ver is a good mindset for regulators to have. And perhaps uh, Peter's point, you they should be going there. Can I? I would like to follow up, Peter, with your volatility point, which was the main point you made, the conceptual issue. And um, so, what would you like? What would you like the regulators to do? What would, What did you want to hear from Janet Yellen that you didn't hear from her? You criticized the speech she made a little while ago about not taking account of financial stability and monetary policy unless all, everything else fails first, using the macro tools first. What would you like, what, what should she have said that would made Peter Fisher uh, a little more comfortable anyhow? And, and then what, sh not, it's more than saying, what should they do? What are the concrete steps the regulators should take that they're not taking? Well, I, I would have been more comforted if I hadn't thought seen interest rate policy completely divorced from prudential policy. I just don't think that's something when you and I joined the Fed, any of us would have thought about, Don, that the, you could entirely separate the two. I think we would have thought that most money comes from bank balance sheets, and we have to care deeply about the asset quality of bank balance sheets, and that, that it's integrated, and you can't do interest rate policy and ignore that. Uh, so, so that's the first conceptual framework, which falls into my bucket of you're still, if you're in that mindset, I don't mean to suggest Chair Yellen is, but it, that you're just trying to pump up the financial intermediaries to promote growth, and you see them as kind of a means to an end. So you would have and run a tighter monetary, a less easy monetary policy. A, a monetary policy that takes account of how rapidly you can grow the financial sector's balance sheet, and that that's a stability concern that, that has to somehow... Be, it has to be constrained by stability concern at some level. And I didn't, I didn't see her in her speech last summer at the IMF offering that conceptual framework. I'd say that was my, my principal worry. Um, and I think that if you do take that into account, if you both at the macro level and at the individual firm level think, well, we really shouldn't be growing credit more rapidly than we're growing the productive potential of the economy. And that's true for the economy as a whole, and that's true for an institution. <laughs> and, and that just happens to tie you back to Section 2A of the Federal Reserve Act. That would have given me a lot more comfort. So it's more conceptual than specific steps you wanted to see, you wanted to see or frame the issue differently. I, I think the Federal Reserve is going to have to, over the next 50 years, figure out how to get financial stability inside its mandate and not have it be a dangling participle. Uh, I, I, just, I, I, just don't, I just don't think it's going to work. Um, section and you don't think the macro prudential tools available to the Fed, to FSOC, to the SEC, to any of the member are, are sufficient to deal with the risks that you see? No, and I, but conceptually, 
does that mean we're going to continue to use interest rate policy to stimulate cr rapid credit growth, but then use something called a macroprudential tool to make sure we don't have rapid credit growth? What's that about? <laughs> that, uh, I, mean, I don't see how that works. That's, again, a, a conceptual muddle. Could think of the macroprudential policy as directing where the credit growth goes and the terms under which credit is made rather than the overall speed. But that's a, perhaps I, a separate discussion for is, coffee. But, but, but I'm curious, to, back to you, Don. I, I think <laughs> that the, 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 the setting in the United Kingdom allows for interest rates to be one of the macroprudential tools, whereas the, the rhetoric on this side of the Atlantic has put them in separate categories. Well, I don't think the rhetoric's that different over there. So I think Governor Carney has made it very clear that he sees macroprudential policy as the first, they're using the same words, first line of defense and monetary policy, the second line of defense on financial stability issues. And a concrete illustration of that is when the Monetary Policy Committee put in their we're going to stay zero until certain thresholds are reached. They said, but you, the Financial Policy Committee, can take us off of that after you've tried everything else, and you then you tell us that our low interest rates are causing financial stability issues. So I don't see a difference across the pond uh, on, that, on that score in the basic attitudes. Do you have any comments on this? Uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, stay I'm enjoying this? watching. I'm learning. <laughs> So you, you, you um, worried, as did Rajan, about the restrictions on credit that were uh, and, and other means of responding to crises. Do you have a, a top few that you would change? What changes would you, if you had to go back and what, why, is, why do you think we're moving in what you would say the wrong direction? What would you do about it? And what would you undo, perhaps, that Dodd Frank did if you could move right. back in the other direction? So, so during the crisis, regulators pushed the boundaries of their authority to engage, to fix the problems given the tools they had and the ability to get new tools. And from Congress's perspective, all Congress has is the law. Congress has no authority to show that the law is implemented and frankly, little redress if the law is violated. So the kind of uh, uh, how sacrosanct the law is, is a reasonable position for those in Congress, and, and that's where I was working during the crisis, to have. However, you know, during the time of the crisis, you know, society accepts that ambulances and fire trucks kind of, you know, and police officers can put on their siren and violate the law. And it's given to them at their discretion. We've seen recently police officers, in my humble opinion, violate the kind of quid pro quo of society. And society is grappling and is yet to figure out how to come down on the officers who seem to have violated the law. With regard to the financial crisis, uh, I see it in both directions. One is it was pretty clear and easy politically to come down on the regulators for somehow violating the law and tapping into that public anger uh, understandably so, about the Hobbesian choice people were faced in, uh, faced with to put in bailouts. So uh, there's a the kind of backlash that Raj and I and, and others express frustration with, and Peter in in in, in his paper, uh, you know, is reasonable. Uh, we, there's an understandable way, but it gets the problem backwards. And so instead, I think I'd like a couple things. One is you know, maybe maybe time heals all wounds. And maybe we can have a bit of a discussion as the history books are written about the value of some of these uh, emergency authorities that saved lives. TARP, you know, how many jobs, where would we have been without the response? Uh, two is an appreciation for the discretion regulators did have. The Fed had not used 13.3 in 75, 80 years, despite a couple financial crises and moments when you went back in their history in the autos in the 50s, there were kind of moments where they came close to the precipice. Uh, and restoring the same with the FDIC and, and their um, uh, blanket use of their systemic risk exemption. Uh, and Congress can get more uh, 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 appreciation for the wisdom of regulators in knowing when to flip that siren. 
Uh, hopefully that will take a little bit of time and we won't move kind of in the opposite direction. Thank you. I think, Rajan, one of the reasons I sense that there's a pushback in what I agree is the wrong direction is a sense that orderly liquidation authority won't work or will be used in ways that Congress didn't intend it to be used to keep alive institutions that are fundamentally unsound rather than, rather than wind them down. Can give us, you and I and Peter serve on the FDIC's systemic resolution committee. Give, give, give your sense of the progress they're making and uh, your view of how this might be used and, and whether you share some of these concerns that OLA will be, will, will be used to get around the, the, the fundamental will of Congress. You know, I think, Don, it would be uh, not merely an extraordinarily courageous, because I wouldn't call it courageous, an extraordinarily stupid <laughs> um, uh, governmental authority that would ignore the basic mandates of orderly liquidation authority in Title II. It says quite bluntly, shareholders have to be wiped out, that management has to be replaced, and that creditors incur losses. And it is difficult for me to see if you had some of the improvements that I think Aaron and I would both like to see, and I believe Peter as well, in um, the ability of the government to intervene, that you would still be able to violate those very clear mandates. Now, I, I can get on a hobby horse for a long time. I, I think we have, we've made enormous progress in getting to a liquidation approach for large financial institutions. But I will revert to the absence of a, a a really formal international approach because we aren't talking about institutions that are anything other than international in scope. Right. Do you have any thoughts on that? I'm, I, 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 I agree with Rajan. I, global coordination of ways to bind countries. Uh, I do think we're always solving the last crisis and it's never the same thing twice. It's not gonna be subprime mortgages. It's not gonna be Tokyo real estate. It's not gonna be Dutch tulips. Uh, but my guess is it's also probably not going to originate in America. The next asset will be bubble or crisis will probably well be imported. Peter? Um, I, well, I agree with Roger and Aaron. Um, I'd just like to, on the political front, if I, if I could, um, I think there's just such a profound misunderstanding on the part of our political class that the financial system we have depends on liquidity illusion. We cannot all take our money out of the bank the same day. We cannot sell our stocks and bonds the same day. Uh, it just the system doesn't work that way. Uh, Keynes taught us that liquidity is, is an antisocial fetish. We, we can't all be liquid. But sometimes that's called the law of large numbers. So, yeah, yes. But, but uh, when everybody tries to take it out at the yes, same time, it, it, it doesn't work. And so the system needs a backstop. We, we like the, the, the uh, velocity of financial transactions more or less that we have in society today. Um, and we, we need a system to backstop it. And as long as we feel we're going to punish, uh, uh, whether they deserve to be punished or not is a different matter, but we're going to punish those who are left holding the bag, as, as Raj explained, under, under Title II. Um, I, I think it's a mistake to think we've really got to tighten up on this or somehow we can, we can resolve the next financial crisis without this grubby business. Um, and I think that that's what's driving the political class, and I, th I just wish they had a better understanding of the velocity of finance that we depend upon. There is a contrast on the two sides of the Atlantic because the Bank of England, if anything, has expanded their access to lender of last resort, yes. but only to heavily regulated, highly regulated companies, not to just anybody, but they've expanded it rather than contracted mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So uh, questions from the audience. Doug. Thank you. Uh, I have one comment and one question, both uh, for uh, Peter. Uh, the comment is, I think when you talk about macroprudential policy, you downplay the extent to which most people see it as a resilience tool rather than as a, an attempt to change the cycle itself. And so you end up putting 
monetary and uh, macroprudential policy on a single spectrum as if it were all about supply of credit. So you might have a comment on that. The uh, question is, could you explain what you mean by volatility mismatch? <laughs> um, uh, well, um, I, it goes to the first point on um, macroprudential and monetary, but it goes to my conversation with Don when we sat down to, to chat. I, I, if we're not constraining the growth of, the, of credit in some way, uh, then I don't think we're in the game. If you're just waiting to clean up the mess the next time we have a financial crisis, that's not the same thing as trying to get growth and resilience, to borrow Aaron's phrase, in the financial system as a whole. Um, so that's why micro, I, I take your point. There are lots of good prudential. Um, I'm in favor of bank supervision and financial supervision. I'm not a gain it. But I, I have to see how it works together with the view that we're going to stimulate the economy through credit growth and we're going to restrain it. And, and having those two tools at war with each other, um, I, I think we have a manic financial sector. To, that, that, that's my view of how it works. Um, the volatility mismatch, um, uh, <coughs> different Assets have different uh, volatility profiles. Uh, w w the expected return they get, the risk that they will perform as expected versus not ex the way they uh, implied volatility would be the concept that we would measure. We have historic volatility. And then we do our best to see what the asset liability mismatch actually is that a firm is running. Now, banks run the most extreme. <laughs> They have zero duration uh, the liabilities in the form of deposits, and then we let them hold all manner of illiquid uh, credit assets on the other side to take a stylized approach. That's a certain volatility mismatch, uh, and they make a certain kind of money on it. Insurance companies, pension funds run very different volatility mismatches. Uh, that are less, less tending to be illiquid. The, our, our Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation here in Washington just doubled its negative equity position from 30 to 60 billion, as I know you would be acutely aware. No one's worried about them running out of money this month. There's no liquidity component to that. They're in a very bad place, um, but filling that hole with capital just conceptually isn't going to solve the problem. It's the nature of the volatility mismatch. We let them run. So thinking of assets and liabilities of, ha of having volatility profiles and then putting them together and seeing how they behave together and, and, and seeing whether that's something you think is sustainable or not is, I think, the, is, is the core of whether we can stabilize individual financial institutions. A closely related issue is liquidity perceptions and liquidity mismatch. And there, putting your other hat on, mm -hmm. we have this asset manager issue mm -hmm. and bond funds and the expectations that the investors in bond funds have expectations of higher liquidity than the bond funds themselves could deliver under stress. Is that part of, is this part of the volatility mismatch yes, you're thinking about and what would you do about it? Um, well, all 40 act funds, bond and equity, yeah. implicitly have, uh, you, you have seven, the liability is converted to cash in seven days on today's closing price, right. whether bond or equity. Right. Um, and the assets may or may not be. Right. So they're all running. That's, that's an expression of a volatility mismatch inside a 40 Act fund. Right. And I think the, the, the challenge I really was giving is I think the authorities have to think what part of the capital structure of the world do they want which type of intermediary to hold. Right now, they're looking out at the world and saying, well, we don't want this one to be risky. We don't want that one to be risky. We don't want insurance companies to be risky. We don't want bond funds to be risky. We don't want banks to be risky. No, this, someone's going to hold each part of the capital structure of the world. <laughs> and you want to think about lining it up, the asset side with the liability side, that looks like it works. And insurance companies look different than money market funds. Um, and if you don't approach it that way, if you approach this sort of one-dimensional risk, th then we're going to accentuate the problem Raj ended with the ugly one of we're just going to be pushing it out to somewhere else. That's the, that's the balloon. We squeeze here and it goes somewhere else. And I think that will not end happily. In the UK, we talk about a waterbed effect instead of a balloon effect. I like it much better. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> 
Hi, good morning. Thank you for being here. My name is Sahan. I'm a student at the University of Iowa uh, here for a summer internship. Uh, I'm just, uh, this is a two-part question. Uh, first part is, um, uh, you know, what do you, uh, what, what, what do you, what does the panel think about possibly bringing back Dodd-Frank, where, not, not Dodd-Frank, I mean, uh, um, Glass-Steagall, where, you know, you, the, the bank, investment banks and commercial banks are separated so that investment banks can take risk out of uh, uh, consumers' uh, consumers' money or, uh, what William Cohen, a financial author, has mentioned, putting investment banks back to private partnerships where the partners, you know, risk their own money. So there's far less risk uh, used than uh, the regular banks that we have now. And the second part of my uh, second question that I have is, of course, 2016 election cycles coming up. Do you guys, uh, uh, what do you guys, uh, what is your comment on Senator Rand Paul's audit the Federal Reserve Bill? And uh, those are my two questions. And thank you for being here. Oh. Who would like to take on some of those questions? I'll, I'll be glad to start okay, with, right. with Glass-Steagall. Um, you know, Glass. there are so many myths about Glass-Steagall that it's hard today to find the reality. Glass-Steagall itself was a total myth. It was based on the assumption that a number of banks had failed because of their securities activities. There wasn't a single bank of any size that failed because of its securities activities. And the principal example which was used, which was Bank of United States, actually failed as for the same reason banks tend to fail, because of real estate activities. Um, likewise, you look at 2008, and it is hard to find a single institution where the outcome would have been different had Glass-Steagall been in effect. So it is hard to see why reintroduction of Glass-Steagall is even close to desirable when there is no record that the problem uh, that is somehow cr created as a myth uh, never really existed. And then there is just one other part of the myth I want to deal with, and that is that all these, these deposits can be used. Glass-Steagall, notwithstanding claims to the contrary, was not repealed by Graham Leach Bliley. One piece of it was repealed. There have always been two pieces, what affiliates can do and what banks can do. And banks, of course, are where the deposits are. Graham Leach Bliley repealed the part dealing with affiliates, the part of Glass-Steagall. It did not touch one iota what banks themselves were prohibited from doing. So I think the Glass-Steagall debate has to be dealt with in terms <coughs> of what really happened in 29, throughout the Depression, uh, 1999 and 2008. So let me, let me start. There's another part of Glass-Steagall that nobody talks about, which was the separation of banking and insurance. In fact, uh, it's not crazy to say the desire to merge a bank and insurance company was one of the driving forces behind Graham Leach Wiley. Uh, nobody seems to, two things we can say. Whatever the theory of commingling banking and insurance in the financial supermarket was, it didn't work. We don't see that. Uh, two is, it had nothing to do with the financial crisis. There were no bank insurance toxic combination that took things down. AIG, non-traditional products, and they did have problems. AIG had substantial problems in its insurance subsidiary unrelated to any banking perspective. So that's an example of kind of the theory led you into one direction. We had an experiment. Market reality is shown doesn't work, mixing the two. Didn't really impact financial stability. With regard to the second part of your question, uh, two things. One is, uh, simply put, I think uh, the Paul bill is a bad idea. I worked at GAO. GAO is a wonderful organization. Having GAO in seven days put out real-time reports, kind of second-guessing the Federal Reserve's monetary policy is a horrible idea. That being said, th that's what the bill is, by the way. The term audit the Fed, which is kind of what it's known by, right? The Fed is audited. It's audited multiple times. Don probably sat on the audit committee of the Fed. I, uh, uh, that being said, there are problems with the Federal Reserve structure there are problems with the Federal Reserve, parts of its transparency, as particularly on regulatory policy. Its monetary policy is very transparent, I think. Uh, um, and there are problems with its governance structure. You know, the, the Federal Reserve has an in, 
inspector general appointed by the chair of the Fed, uh, who can't investigate all of the activities of the Federal Reserve system throughout the regional banks. There seems to be a growing problem among groupthink and the lack of dissent, a kind of healthy amount of dissent by some of the appointed governors, and potential problems in creating independent uh, people becoming Federal Reserve Bank presidents. There are 11 sitting Federal Reserve Regional Bank presidents. Ten of them were employees or members of the Federal Reserve Regional Bank board immediately prior to that. That feels a little tight-minded. So I think one of the reasons that the Paul Bill or this Audit the Fed mantra has become very popular, I'm glad you're here from Iowa, I think we in Washington fail to appreciate how unpopular parts of the central bank are in parts of the heartland of this country and have always been in American history. The Fed is America's third attempt at a central bank. Uh, the first two didn't make it. Uh, and so uh, that being said, just because there's a problem doesn't mean a solution makes the world a better place. And this solution put forward uh, uh, on the Paul Bill would not, would be a step backward. I associate myself with my colleagues' remarks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and that's, uh, well, we're, we're out of time. No, no, no. we have more time? You can go until 10.30. Oh, good, okay. Oh. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, Rajan, you mentioned <coughs> the profitability issue, uh, low interest rates, uh, the effect of regulation, and whether this was uh, sustainable. Um, I hear a lot, and I'm, I'm distancing myself a little bit from this, but I do hear it a lot from some very credible people um, that the financial sector is too large, um, that it's actually inhibiting growth, uh, it's attracting talent away from things they should be doing, uh, developing new Facebooks, I guess, or whatever, uh, doing other things, um, and that uh, bankers make too much money. So that the notion, I think, is, is quite entrenched in, in, in popular thinking that uh, somehow that, that reducing the profitability or the size of the financial sector would be a, a good thing. And just before I close, I want to relate the fact that my daughter's father-in-law, who lives in Indiana, um, asked me, what about this uh, Rand Paul bill? And uh, he said, now the Fed is, is sort of owned by several of the big banks, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's some illusions there about it. Go ahead, Ken. Well, well. I, um, you know, I guess the best way to answer this, I would agree that it is, uh, that is a popular set of perceptions. Being popular, of course, doesn't make it uh, correct. Um, and frankly, you are seeing the uh, banking system shrink. You are seeing talent leaving the banking system or not going to it. Um, and uh, again, if somebody would just do some legitimate research as opposed to um, uh, really just spouting uh, political views, um, there is the suggestion made that you look at 2008 and you look today and the U.S., the larger, largest banks are larger than they were then. Not so fast. Subtract the emergency deals, the countrywide, the Merrill Lynch, the WAMU, the Bear Stearns, and the banking industry is actually, the large banks are actually significantly smaller than they were in 2008. So um, I think maybe for good, maybe for bad, what uh, the, the desire to shrink the largest banks is in fact occurring, and uh, you know, do you really want to have a situation where not if, but when we have another crisis, which none of us can foresee exactly what will cause it, that there's nobody around who will be willing to step in and buy assets or buy institutions to help buffer the crisis. Do you have any views on the ownership structure of the Federal Reserve? Aaron's already uh, addressed some of those issues. Peter? Um, 
Well, it's true that member banks own stock of the reserve banks and get a statutory dividend, but they don't seem to exercise control that normally goes with that when we think about that in uh, corporate governance terms. We, th we think of control as tending to lie with the Board of Governors and their staff. So, but I think there are a number of, uh, uh, the evolution of the Federal Reserve System has left it with an imperfect governance structure, as Aaron was saying, which I would share. <laughs> Don, could I just add one point? To the extent, and I believe this is the case, that the members of the Reserve Bank boards are really there as sounding boards, as informational sources. I think one better look long and hard at the New York Fed and the change in the composition of that board and whether it is still an appropriate sounding board for the New York Fed. Well, the, I don't know if you saw the paper, the revelation in the Philadelphia Fed board's structure of picking a new president that it was a, just reported in the paper that one of the board members sat on the selection committee sat through the 12 finalists, and then decided to put his name in the hat, and a week later was named the next president. Hold the Cheney. <laughs> so, yes. uh, a few of you, uh, uh, Nancy Jacklin, uh, a few of you uh, mentioned the issue of uh, structural regulatory reform. And for those of us who've been in this business 30 or 40 years, we hear about that a lot. But I wonder, uh, and it never seems to happen, but I wonder whether there are enough changes now that the tide may slowly be moving in that direction. Uh, is the financial sector of the view at this point that regulatory arbitrage is not what they're after, but regulatory simplicity may cost them less in the long run? And is there any movement on the Hill among the agency, um, among the committee heads, uh, to be willing to look at some simplification in the regulatory structure. So, so I guess, um, uh, in addition, the Bipartisan Policy Center believes that we ought to consolidate. Uh, former Fed Chairman Volcker with the Volcker Alliance has put forward a big and thoughtful uh, proposal. So I think there is growing appreciation that this is a source of vulnerability, a source of instability is our own regulatory system. Unfortunately, history does not offer many high points. Uh, each of the varying regulators was created in response to a different financial crisis. Going back, somebody mentioned the OCC being 150 years old. There was a national banking crisis during the Civil War. It didn't just m come out of President Lincoln's I imagination. He wasn't, didn't, I don't think banking was the number one issue on President Lincoln's plate. Uh, that being said, uh, you know, Dodd-Frank was the same. Every crisis creates these new entities, but they f tend to f uh, live on. Dodd-Frank created three more, OFR, you know, FSOC, CFPB, uh, eliminated one, the Office of Thrift Supervision, so we're net plus two. Uh, eventually, this is going to have to end uh, at some point, or we're going to have a total alphabet soup. Uh, but it, it's, it, I can't say that there's any, you know, there's growing appreciation of the problem. Uh, the likelihood of it uh, being solved before a crystallizing event unclear. One thing we put forward is an intermediate step where the regulators could work in a team. I think one of the most important things that uh, was said this morning by OFR Director Berner was the difficulty in data sharing. That come, once you come into Washington, it's a lot more complicated than you think. We have kind of a solution to that. Have all the regulators do a joint examination. Instead of having these large financial institutions get four or five separate examinations, write one joint exam report. Everybody in that way would have access to the data in real time. The regulators would just have to trust each other's examiners a little bit, uh, and they'd have to have a little more of a common base, and we think both of those things would be a positive outcome. And regulators, by the way, could do that right now. They need no new legal authority to run that type of pilot program. Back there. Hi, Justin Chardon, Bipartisan Policy Center. Uh, Aaron mentioned the FSOC is an agency that was created as a step forward but really hasn't gone far enough or hasn't been constituted the right way. In an ideal world, what should FSOC be focused on to have the best net positive benefit, and do they have the authority to do that right now? Well, I, I'll be glad to start. I think that uh, FSOC has obviously had to spend an enormous amount of time and energy on the designation of non-bank SIFIs. 
uh, to me, it should be a joint FSOC, OFR effort to really get the collective arms of the various uh, agencies involved around the totality of what we have done in terms of regulation, where it should be strengthened, where it should be liberalized, uh, where it should be uh, better coordinated. That is what uh, my view of what FSOC could be most valuable. It was supposed to figure out the risks and not just uh, non-bank uh, SIFIs. It shouldn't be just a glorified uh, version of the president's, whatever it's called, working group, financial institutions working group. Peter, you have a few right. Okay, back here. I'm John Gilmore with the Comptroller of the Currency. Peter mentioned uh, sources and absorbers of, of volatility. I was just curious as to if you could, if you could expand on that and identify some of the parties and then how they work within the U.S. economy and contribute to our, to our growth? Um, well, uh, a balance sheet is, is good at absorbing volatility. The, the, the banking example I meant to use, its simplest, is when you see that they don't have very short-dated liabilities. And, and that, so if you've got long-dated liabilities and volatile assets, which is what insurance companies classically would tend to have, uh, you're an effective absorber of volatility. In the short run, assets and liability, assets go up and down in value, and you can withstand that volatility, so you can, in, in, in conventional language, take more risk. Um, if you've got very short-dated liabilities, uh, then you're more vulnerable. So, so that's the simplest way to think about a volatility mismatch. And I think every balance sheet is better or worse at absorbing volatility. Um, and I think that... Um, uh, the thinner your capital, the more likely you are to uh, not be a good absorber of volatility. But I think it's a mistake we've made of thinking of capital as the only thing or the principal thing that makes you good at absorbing volatility. Um, uh, so uh, I, I think that is a, is a, I'm offering that as a conceptual framework to then look and say, who do you want to hold the long-dated equity volatility risk in our economy? Um, and I gave a talk in Europe uh, last summer uh, in which they are simultaneously both very focused on wanting more long-term investments and imposing a bank capital-like regi regime on insurance companies. And I made the point to them that the Marshall Plan was a trivial source of support for Europe's reconstruction after World War II, a tiny share of European GDP. Insurance company balance sheets were a major source of rebuilding Europe after the war in long-term investment, that they permitted them to take those long-dated risks. And yet imposing a capital regime which punishes you for taking long-dated risky assets, if you will, e even though your liabilities are very long-dated, is going to diminish their capacity to have long-term investment in Europe to help them rebuild their way out of this most recent crisis. So those are a few more thoughts on just every balance sheet is better or worse at absorbing volatility given the characteristics of its assets and liabilities. So would, would you uh, say the uh, regulation the, for the first time of bank liquidity so what, what you're defining as volatility is also can be seen as this maturity mismatch. And to some extent, the regulators, at least on the bank side, are focused by now imposing liquidity <coughs> requirements on the banks to better match the... I, yes, I, but I think that... I, I think if you step back and think about the volatility characteristic of the, the, the liability in the asset in totality, not just liquidity is one or maturity is one, but it's, it's the, how risky the other things that go into the prices moving around of the asset and liability. I, I suggest looking at all of it. Now, the banking system is the one that runs the most extreme asset liability mismatch. Right. And so there are reasons for concern. Um, but I, I've actually been trying to unpack the complaint that uh, the FSOC and the SIFI process are treating everything as if it's a bank. And I, and I think the one way to begin unpacking that is say, well, what is the asset liability mismatch you want pension funds to run? And what is the asset liability mismatch you want insurance companies to run? And then what is the asset liability mismatch you want banks to run? 
And you can think of the, the narrow banking proposals or the 100% equity banking proposals right. as a way of changing what the asset liability mismatch of the thing we call banks are. And so this, this is a way to start unpacking this complaint that the FSOC is treating everything as if it's a bank, <laughs> is to actually then ask, well, what is the asset liability mismatch you want them to run? Okay. So now I do think we're out of time. Yeah. Is that correct? Did I get it right this time? Okay. All right. So thank, join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>